Hello, everybody. I believe, if I have done everything correctly, and it is entirely possible that I haven't, uh, that we should be live, and things should be yes, the thing, the way the things are supposed to be. Uh, let me know in chat if you can hear me, if the music is too loud, and indeed if you can hear <laughs> the other person on the call right now. Hey, everybody! How y'all doing? It's been a while. It's been a while. Live and clear. Excellent. Chat is telling us that we're good. Excellent. Well then, uh, hello, lightners and lampshades. My name is TB Sky and uh, Deltarune Chapter Two. Wow, what? Wow, that's a thing. Uh, this is a lot to talk about there, and it's too much to talk about for one person. So I decided to bring someone else to talk about it with me. Would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Folks, it's Solutions Center here, your ghost of a host, uh, playing fighting games and horror games, and also a lot of Delta Room, which sort of doesn't count as a fighting game, but absolutely counts as a horror game in certain in a lot of aspects. How are you all doing today, Skyen? What yeah. the hell did we just get ourselves into with this game? Yeah, holy shit. Like, there's fucking Toby Fox, man. Like, just fucking Toby Fox. Good lord, that person. Uh, and so I guess the question to open with is the one that I put in the title. Chapter 2. We waited three years for this thing after the initial demo of, of Deltarune. Was it worth it? Like, what was the thing that he put out really worth all that waiting time? I know what my answer is. Uh, how about you? Um, given the theory crafting we've put into this game, I can at least confidently say that... Uh, he definitely didn't waste our time with this game. And given what it set the stage for and everything we've experienced in the game, then yeah, holy shit. Uh, uh, to say that we're eagerly anticipating Chapter 3 is maybe us uh, underselling it a little bit. Yeah, like, good lord, because, like, Chapter 1 was this very, like, self-contained thing. Like, it was a demo for the thing, and it's probably, like, one of the best indie game demos I've ever played in my life. Um, just in terms of, of the completeness of things, it, it has a complete narrative start to finish, and then it, like it opens a bunch of questions, but it doesn't feel like it's an incomplete story. Like you go through it and you've played like a pretty complete story with Susie in the underground, you've deposed the king, you've saved the world. It's sort of satisfying in and of itself, but then that last fucking cliffhanger at the end with fucking Chris turning, like, tearing their own heart out of their chest and throwing it in the cage and turning around with a knife, and you go, oh my god, it's Kara, or something, I don't know. And then you have to wait for three years for chapter two. And then he did it again yeah. at the end of chapter two, the bastard. And and throughout chapter two as well, given the, the themes we'll be discussing later on in the, in the stream, of course. But uh, definitely, uh, I had a moment with chapter one where I was wondering where... I was wondering if the genocide players, which I was not one of, unfortunately, because I just didn't want to spend the time trying to beat Sans, but I was wondering if the genocide players of Undertale were wondering if their files were still corrupted after their run at the end of the game. Because certainly there's a lot of parallels with the previous games that uh, that would suggest such a thing, right? That would, He was definitely designing Chapter 1, and especially the climax of Chapter 1, to... Uh, to cause conversations about the uh, impact that, that our Undertale playthrough had. Whether or not that was actually applicable or intended, um, I think that kind of comparison might have been unavoidable with the whole ripping out your heart and slamming it into a cage routine. Yeah. Uh, by the way, chat is saying, and I can hear it too, uh, your sound jumps a little bit every once in a while. Like, all of a sudden you get really loud and then it sort of pings back down. I don't know what's going on there. I'm actually not sure what's going on myself. Uh, I don't have anything in my room that might be causing that. Yeah, I think it's when you oh, move closer uh, or further away from the mic or something. Yeah, let me try to move the mic closer just in general, just to make it a little more consistent. That okay. should help. Hopefully, hopefully. Okay. Right. And, yeah, like, the, the comparisons don't... Like, Fox himself has tweeted that he's sort of happy that with Deltarune Chapter 2, people are finally seeing it as a separate thing from Undertale. Like, not just as, oh, this is some kind of Undertale prequel or whatever, but as a sort of companion piece to it, which I think is, like... Yeah. It's a it's a it's a it's a it's a strange complaint to have when like you literally open Delta Rune with like <laughs> with like fucking Toriel and Asquare in this parade past all of literally all of the goddamn characters from Undertale in this new setting. Like I think it's kind of unavoidable that you're gonna draw comparisons there, but it does feel like with Chapter Two, like it feels like it's doing something else. Like it feels like it's it's trying to examine some very different questions. 
Uh, structurally and narratively, I think that was the first thing that we noticed that um, as soon as you fully understood what the overall shape of the game was, the uh, comparisons to Undertale was definitely uh, starting to fade. And rather than him complaining about it, it feels a lot like the trap has finally sprung, the trap that he intended for us. All the expectations that we made along the way just got snared into the actual like structure of, of uh, Delta Room and are now torn into shreds because uh, we cannot be using the previous game as, as signposts for what's going to be coming up next. No, I think I think thematically there's some overlap, but but we'll probably get into that. But yeah, definitely. Like I, I know a lot of theory crafters are very excited. Oh, Gaster! It's going to be the Gaster thing with the, with the Gaster. Like the, they're sort of very excited about that sort of deep lore plot connection. And like I feel like maybe that's there somehow, but I really don't feel like like Undertale wasn't really about the Gaster stuff, and I really don't think Delta Rune is going to be about the Gaster stuff either. Ultimately, I think I think that's more of a Kind of like, I think of that more like Nick Fury at the end of Iron Man coming in like, have you heard of the Avengers initiative? Like, it's it's that sort of thing, but it's not really important to the movie itself. Yeah. And honestly, it feels as if Gaster's, all the mysteries involving Gaster are mostly there as basically a meta-narrative within the game, right? The You have Undertale as its own story, Deltarune as, as, its, own, as its own developing fable, and then the Gaster stuff is mostly feels mostly like commentary about the nature of NPCs and stuff like that. And we'll, we'll probably go into a lot of that later, but definitely the fact that we can find references to Gaster, like trying to input your name as Gaster in the game and getting kicked out of the game entirely, means that it isn't completely like irrelevant in terms of like what Toby Fox is trying to communicate, but what he's trying to communicate is definitely on a different level compared to the rest of the story. Yeah, I think so. And speaking of themes, we might as well move into like one one of the one of the early themes that people sort of fixated on with Delta Rune. And fair and, and and frankly, fair enough, um, was the way that the demo opens with it. You, like you do all go through all this character creation, you name them, you, like you, you make a particular character model, like very small changes, you change choose colors and so it's not. And then it says your choices will be discarded because your choices do not matter in this world, which is an idea that's sort of echoed all throughout the demo over and over again, is that like, yeah, your choices don't matter, it doesn't matter what you choose. Um and that comes back into like the overall structure of the game, which is very much this sort of classic fantasy prophecy thing of like oh there was a prophecy of once upon a time where the hero shall arrive and do the thing and so there is this theme of predestination going on that i'm very absolutely. curious about absolutely uh especially in the first game we we're always meant to defeat the the evil king in the second game we we're always meant to over depose the evil queen like even as the two settings were were like astoundingly different like they were the two games the, the, the settings of both chapters effectively were in different genres. The overall structure of it was very much the uh, traditional like adventure story, right? Like it was very much the, uh, what you'll consider a really default sort of D&D campaign. Even in uh, it, like in all cases, it was a party with like different, like, with like specialized roles. Uh, you as the leader, a uh, big bad that you obviously have to triumph over. And even as the mechanics of it were Undertale like in that you don't really actually have to kill anybody, the the structures of the underworld themselves were basically what you expect to be kids of hunters. Yeah, like it's 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 based it was sort of a very basic narrative. And it worked really well, like especially because um, this is something that that we see with chapter two as well. Like chapter two was not uh, chapter one was not really about Chris very much at all. Chapter one was about Susie. Like it was about Susie starting out as this like very hostile, very sort of I don't I don't want to talk to anyone, don't want to relate to anyone, don't want to be anyone's friend. I, I'm I'm evil and I'm mean and I'm cruel, and that's all I'm ever gonna be. I'm kind of like she sort of seems to have this idea that she's doomed to be that. Because everyone already perceives her as that. That's one of the things, this is going back to chapter one, one of the things I noticed in that game is that you are told what to think about Susie before she ever comes on screen. Because every single character in the game reacts to her like, holy shit, this is the most dangerous, terrifying, evil, cruel, violent bully you'll ever meet in your entire life. And the entire game frames her as such. And then as you go through chapter one, you sort of realize, oh no, wait, actually, she doesn't She doesn't especially want to be cruel. She just kind of defaults to that role because it's expected of her and because she doesn't know how to relate to people on another level. And then she meets Lancer and through the adventure, she ends up becoming like, oh, hey, no, actually, like she ends up sort of freeing herself from that predestination. 
Then we get chapter two, and this one seems to be a lot more about Noelle, specifically Noelle and her relationship with her mother, who's the mayor. Yeah, especially with uh, Susie to wrap around that, I did notice that uh, especially as I was going through the uh, original chapter one materials, that you really don't get to see Susie's eyes until later in the game, right? Yeah. So in terms of like getting, getting to know the character, uh, even as you are introduced to Susie in the first place, uh, you don't actually get to see uh, don't actually get to see eye to eye uh, with her until much uh, much much later on. Uh, Noelle is a different take on that in that she already has a pretty game history with Chris and much of uh, at least muster of the so called real world cast. But in terms of like character uh, characterizations, we don't actually get to know all that much about her until she's uh, exploring the. Uh, exploring the game world with us in more than one sense. Yeah, yeah. Like, Noelle is like, interesting because, like, she's, she's like, the first... Like, with Chris and Susie, they have no connection prior to, to Deltarune Chapter 1. Noelle, on the other hand, oh, boy. Oh, boy, there seems to be some history there. Oh, boy, there seems oh, yeah. to be a past. Um, yeah. Which is, uh, like... To say that she's the main character is to, uh, is to like, only give you, a, like, a rough idea of what that involves, right? No, the entirety of the Chapters 2 story is very much, like, either metaphorically about Noelle or directly in conversation with her discussing, like, the the overall shape and uh, shaping view of the world around her. And, like, that's not, that's not just with the game world itself, but also the actual, like, city of monsters that you live in in the real world. Yeah, very much so. Um... Which sort of ties into, like, um, so the dark worlds that exist in, in, in this game. Like, the first one, it was very obviously, okay, so you walk into the into the school closet, you go to the dark world, and that dark world is based on, like, the toys and the board games and the stuff in the storage room of the school. With, like, you have, you have the board game, you have, like, the pawns of, of the chess game, you have the playing cards, lancers, the spades, and, like... This is a very clear theme. Then chapter two, we go to the school library, which again, like, ties to Noelle because she's the nerd who likes to study a lot. Like, she's the very sort of in her head kind of, of, of nerdy character who spends a lot of time in the library. And so this is her dark world. This is the one that belongs specifically to her. And what is it? Well, it's the inside of a computer. It's a sort of, sort of funhouse mirror version of the internet, essentially. Uh, not, that's not just a reference like how much studying she does, right? But also like the cityscape itself is a direct reference later on in the game to like what her sister promised to bring her to, right? Yeah. The city that she, that she never got to explore, the places, the exciting and foreign places she, she never got to visit. And like even looping back to the library scene early on in chapter two, they make it ex explicit what these things are. The dark world isn't just a uh, alternate universe, for example, but uh, I believe we reference as psychotropic landscapes in relation to the, the real world and the real characters. Um, if you bring up comparison, I think I have a couple of comparison images for you, right? Of how the setting is, uh, is uh, how underworld setting is uh, shown versus uh, how uh, the Delta Room locations are the castle, the uh, castle and the library, for instance, and the uh, and the Chapter Two city. Yeah, yeah. it's it's this difference uh, between Chapter One being a, again this very traditional sort of fantasy town with oh here's the blacksmith and here's the shop and here's the tavern and so on and so forth, and then Chapter Two is like you're dodging traffic. <laughs> uh, but you're dodging traffic and the cars themselves are are cartoonish. This is basically like, like even even in terms of like uh, of of a basically a, a 2D uh, a pixel game. This is a very uh, cartoony style compared to uh, even what we see out in, in the monster world, right? Yeah. And going back to chapter one, the castle itself, as you see, wraps around Chris because it, the castle itself is, is is not only distorted, but also like paper thin, literally. Yeah. And this compared to the more sedate style of Undertale setting um, with the castle and everything else, uh, as cartoony as Undertale got, it didn't like explicitly present itself as some kind of distortion or some kind of like uh, falsified world, right? So we get a real sense that the, that the uh, not only is the uh, is the dark world like supposed to be a reflection of something, but that's explicitly made clear the moment that Ralsei actually tells you to go back to the game room and gather everything in it into a big like ball of stuff to toss into the library, and then it transforms back into the realm that you were familiar with in the previous chapter. Yeah. 
exactly. Which is interesting. Like it, it, it's so it really is a thing of like these places reflect the psychology of the characters who relate to them or who are part of them, and which is where I'm really interested in like what the hell is going to happen in chapter three, given the place that the fountain was spawned this time. Like, oh, I'm, oh, I'm excited for it. Um, but yeah, it it's it sort of falls into like if we place this into a literary context, this falls very much with squarely within like the the tradition of portal fiction, and very explicitly, I'd say there's like there's a lot of of um. Of legacy of Alice in Wonderland through the Looking Glass, like it's very much yeah. that kind of a thing. Pacing the White Rabbit, hmm. who happens to have a lot of white fur, happens to be very fuzzy. Yeah, yeah, who indeed? Uh, <laughs> who indeed? Well, that would be Ralsei, or hmm, should we say the name a different way, Asriel? Uh, because boy, howdy, Ralsei. There's a lot to talk about with him. We won't go over all of it just to start with, but. We'll we'll like we'll bring up Ralsei as as a starting point because he's sort of the 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 constant between chapter uh, be, between chapters. Like he's this character who put you on this quest. Like you meet him in the underground, and he's the one who tells you, "Oh, prophecy, seal the fountains." And he's the person who's constantly pushing you towards saving the world, essentially. In fact, he's the one that knows everything that's going on in the game itself. Uh, even if, even as you're talking to the bosses and every, and all the other NPCs, it becomes quite clear that anything to do with the darkness, uh, nobody is actually an authority on what's going on except for Ralsei, which obviously is inherently suspicious. I've seen Chad made a lot of conversations about what the fluffy boy's been up to. <laughs> um, but to be fair, he hasn't been hostile in any sense to you. In fact, quite the opposite. It takes a lot of uh, takes a lot of effort to make him even slightly uh, in interpretable as hostile. In fact, we'll be going to, into that later because the efforts involved in that happen to dive into the deeper parts, uh, the deeper mysteries of the game, right? Yeah, and the thing about, about Ralsei is like also he's the character who doesn't really, at least yet he hasn't had any kind of a story arc. Like Chris, you sort of do see the, is the development in Chris as a character as, we, as we're controlling them as, as they walk around the world. Like you see characters change in relationship to them, but Ralsei seems to be very constant. Like, Ralsei has the, is, is this very constant presence of always being the the sort of um, like, being really very much the core of the party in a lot of ways. Like, the person who's constantly sort of trying to bring everyone else together around around the same goal. This constantly trying to be nurturing. Like, the, the mom of the party essentially, in a, in a sense. Or the big brother, as oh. the case may be. Either a big brother or suspiciously, almost like a play, uh, DM with a playable character. Yeah, <laughs> a DM with a playable character. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there really is that kind of vibe to to him, isn't there? Um, which and I find interesting. That's definitely the sort of role that. That's also like definitely the sort of role that an older brother would pick up with a bunch of friends that just start to uh, start to play fancy games more seriously. So you know, the the comparison is obviously hard to avoid because his, his name's obviously just a just a back. Uh, Anagram. Scrambling up as real. Anagram. Yeah, that was the word I was looking for. Uh, obviously, it's a uh, anagram of Asriel. And obviously, Asriel's presence is a massive like void within the game, despite how often he shows up in the dialogue and, and the discussions with the NPCs. So I almost want to say that this is this might be a red herring on Toby Fox's part yeah. to say that Ralsei is directly related to Asriel, but all the signs are there. So how are we supposed to avoid talking about it, right? Yeah, Asriel is interesting because because he's this sort of constant presence throughout both games, but he's a presence in the sense of of being conspicuously absent. Like you see this in in um, let me see if I can find the particular picture I'm looking for here. Uh, Chris and Asriel's room, for example. Like there's this very like it's not even subtle. Like I know writers use subtlety and they're all cowards. It's on the left yes. side. We have trophies, we have diplomas, we have like decorations on the walls, and it's sort of bright and like orange and colorful, and, and like the bed is well made, and there's a computer and stuff. And then if I move out of the way for a second, over on Chris's side of the room, we have this sort of shabby gray looking bed and a gray lamp and empty shelves, no decorations of any kind, and this sort of ratty little bird cage in a wagon kind of thing. So, like, visually, there's this... suspicious stain. 
Yeah, the, visually there's this immediate establishing of a complete contrast between like obviously the golden boy over on the left, like the the achiever, the 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 track star, like the the popular person. Like, they don't know if they're if if Asriel is a jock necessarily, but like clearly the popular one who everyone likes. And then there's Chris on the other side who throughout the game gets characterized as like this weird creepy kid that nobody really everyone feels sort of vaguely uncomfortable about in some way. Um, yeah. In the that, real world, he's very much presented like an empty shell, right? And this is like blatantly symbolized by his bedroom. Yeah, he, except he, when you go to the dark world, he he is very much characterized as a sort of of, of weirdly sort of this a kid with he's not who's not all there kind of thing. And in the uh, dark world, when you go to the room that Ralsei has prepared for Chris in his castle in the dark world. What do we find? Well, a copy of the exact same room, but without Asriel's bed. And here, all the trophies and the diplomas and the nice colored bed she uh, sheets are on Chris's side of the room. And that's again, this thing of like psychotropic landscapes, the landscapes reflect the characters who are there. So insofar as we're getting a characterization of Chris, I think there is like a, a, a deep thing going on um, about the relationship between Chris and Asriel. Like, it's these two brothers' relationship that's somewhere at the very core of all of this is the these two brothers, their particular relationship, and then everything else is sort of getting drawn into that orbit, which we see with, with uh, specifically with Noel um, and the stories... Uh, that we sort of that we sort of get hinted at and get told about Noel and how she relates to Chris and Asriel and the stuff that happened with December. Yeah, um, I also couldn't help but notice as I was going through the files again that a lot of the real world settings currently take place in what appears to be the autumn of the uh, of the monster world, and Asriel is coming back in a couple of weeks, just as I would guess narratively as December as the winter starts to roll uh, roll over. Yeah, but I think timing wise. There is an un, there's an often unmentioned aspect of the game in that timing wise, it seems as if the the winter season is where the climax is going to be coming up in a couple of chapters too. Yeah, like the winter is coming indeed. Um yes. and December is coming, which is gonna be like again, which is probably why we get Noel's story so early to set those things in motion before winter has to arrive in, in the actual narrative. And Noel is fascinating because like Depending on which route you take through the game, and we'll get to Snowgrave, don't you worry. Uh, depending on yeah. which route you take through the game, um, like Noel, you get to know more or less about Noel and her backstory, and especially her relationship to Chris. Uh, because in the normal route, in the in the if you're not a fucking sociopath route, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> she she is a, sort of just this sort of timid, very sort of enthusiastic. Like genuinely seems quite kind of happy, nerdy little scaredy cat of a girl, like a, a deer in headlights. Quite literally, is her characterization, um, and that you kind of don't get to know that much about her relationship with Chris. But if you go the other way, you get to learn that she has history with with Chris, like that that something happened between them, and that Chris used to be close question mark with. Noelle's sister December as well, and that they all went to the graveyard once upon a time, and like Chris has like has been playing pranks on Noelle and scaring her for a long time, like doing these little spooky things with her. So, like Noelle is another one of those characters, like where she knows a lot more than she's letting on, I think, or rather, she knows a lot more than she's letting herself believe. Yeah. Um Especially in the characterization on the other arc, it also becomes quite clear that whatever relationship she has with Chris, even if we don't see them talking to school as much, she's unqu literally unquestion unquestioningly tr uh, trust uh, trust. Uh, sorry, gotta phrase myself. She trusts him pretty much unquestionably. Like all the yeah. things we put her through, she doesn't even begin to doubt the main character, which would have definitely been something that everybody else would have drawn him up short on. So yeah. there's a lot more implication there than there is actual text. So unfortunately we're back in the realm of subtext, but whatever like childhood relation to, relation they have, especially whatever happened in the past, uh, leaves her to believe that despite Chris's reputation as being creepy, that she can trust him, that she can trust Chris fully. Yeah, and I'm not sure if they've necessarily gained that trust in the playthrough so far, but that obviously depends on the player. Yeah, it is interesting, like the way that Noel relates to Chris, 
and how many excuses that she's willing to make for Chris's behavior. <laughs> like, especially that bit is like, and that gets into some of the really, like, Snowgrave is already uncomfortable, but wow, boy, howdy, the the sort of gaslighting oh and abusive, emotional abuse that goes on there is like, ooh, these are kids, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that the, the whole Snowgrave discussion is very much a black hole with its own gravity well. I think we're starting to get a little sucked in there, honestly. Yeah, uh, let's... But we uh, will absolutely be... We will absolutely be diving into the darkness eventually. Yeah, but let's move on to Susie instead for now, um, who takes yeah. on more... Like, she's the primary character of the first chapter in the dark world, anyway. And now here yeah. in chapter two, she takes on, again, much more of a Rolse like supporting cast role. Uh, being a secondary okay. character where the primary characters would be like again Chris and Noel specifically and Susie is interesting because like she she had her arc in in the first game from being this completely brutal like ev genuinely a very brutal character who like who clearly is trying everything she can everything in her power to push people away to not relate to them to not be around them to not have to like emotionally connect with them in any way what sh shape or form and then in chapter two we do see her like She's still, like, the uh, sort of uh, sundere, like, I, I don't want to be your friend anyway. Like, she still does that, but it's still also clear that, like, no, no, she's having a good time. She's enjoying being around the party. She enjoys teasing Ralse. She enjoys being around. She's having a good time, which I think is kind of wonderful, like, to see her grow like that. Yeah. Um, it's quite clear that uh, I wouldn't say that her characterization stagnated, but definitely she's reached... Uh, she's already reached basically the resolution to her overall character in chapter one, right? And that from being closed off, she now actually has friends, she actually has companions, and she's finding that she finds this extremely enjoyable. And so chapter two, the main the main actual conflict for her is whether or not they should actually be closing all the dark mountains, given how much she enjoys being able to play with them in these in these uh, fantasy worlds. Yeah. Um, that's not like a hearing conflict conflict. And even when she's outside in the real world, she's still like noticeably a lot more comfortable in her own skin, still like an awkward goof, but being able to visit her friends' places and meet their parents on a non-confrontational basis, all this is a huge contrast to how she was originally presented. And therefore there isn't much reason for her to further develop, right? Yeah, at least not in chapter two. Like I'm still curious about her home life situation because oh, yeah. like when she comes over to Chris's house at the end of the game she doesn't have to call her parents like almost as though either yeah. her parents wouldn't care that she's not there or that there are no parents to call like I either or um and also like when you look at her sprite like her base sprite like she has this like her pants are torn and her clothes are a little bit baggy and stuff and it's hard to see in the tiny 2d sprites but like I get the sense of, like that she's being presented as like a kid who maybe doesn't have that like who's who doesn't have that many resources like i mean your first impression is that you want to kind of see her he see her as like an all all culture punk right yeah but it becomes quite clear that isn't quite the uh, situation there she's not dressing to be edgy she's just dressing because that's what her options are when actually given a chance to like express herself she goes with the hair metal aesthetic instead which i think is pretty funny <laughs> Yeah, and that's also the thing, like, when, when Rolsey gives her a room in the castle, like, that's clearly, that's clearly big for her. Like, that's clearly, like, a, that's a big deal for her to, like, oh, shit, my own room, as though she's never had that before. Which, again, is the kind of thing that makes you go, what the... Like, when she's already someone who's so closed off, who has so much trouble relating to people, who is so aggressive, and, like, who, who resorts to violence so quickly and who's, who has such a difficult time letting other people get close emotionally, and then you get these little hints of like, oh, wow, my own room, people are treating me nicely, I do not understand this, why would someone... And even in, in the start of the game, like when Noelle comes up and offers to study with Susie because Noelle has the most adorable crush in the universe on her, Susie's mm -hmm. still like, what the fuck, why would she want to study with me? Why, does she, why would she want to be around me? Why would she even want to talk to me? I don't understand it, which like implies a lot of... It implies a lot of things about what Susie's life might be like outside of this, which again, as you say, explains why she sort of latches onto the idea, hey, why don't we just like make more dark worlds? This is it's awesome down here. Kind of sucks out in the real world. Yeah. And like, honestly, yeah. Um, that's also brought up how uh, Susie been found eating just like the randomest things out there, including yeah. the milk left out for gas and everything. Yeah. 
everything everything tells us that whatever Susie is struggling with, uh, it's probably one of those grim real world situations that's just going to make us sad to find out in later chapters. Yeah. And how that ultimately gets resolved, because I don't think I don't think Susie's place in the story is necessarily done, obviously. How that gets resolved will probably do a lot with how the with with uh, Chris's overall narrative as well, right? The struggles with uh, struggles with with uh, real world circumstances they don't necessarily have a lot of control over, or as the game keeps on uh, keeps on uh, reminding us how our choices can affect. Yeah, your choices don't matter in this world, and like for Susie, like if you live in poverty, you know what that fucking feels like. Just like boy not having choices that's 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 a thing you understand at that point but Especially we have to move on kids. to a less a plus well actually no let, let me just gush about the romance with noelle a little bit just just a little bit because like <laughs> you get this sense from like noelle drops these little hints that she has like a she might enjoy being bullied a little bit which is a common experience like, it's, it's very valid she might enjoy being bullied a little bit and that might be why she sort of initially is attracted to Susie. A little bit. And then Susie, on the other hand, is someone who, like, kind of doesn't actually enjoy bullying people that much. And anytime she's interacted with Noelle, she's trying so hard to be nice. Like, she's trying so hard to be so nice without being polite about it. Like, just like, yeah, it's like, sure. Like, you can see, like, just the writing and the way the character sprites are made with these two. How nervous and stupid they get around each other and how much neither of them have any fucking idea what they're doing. Mm, it's delicious. It's wonderful. It's so cute. It's adorable. Oh, God, they need to kiss. Like, they need to, they need to get, they need to finally <laughs> be allowed to, because the fucking Ferris wheel scene, Toby. How could you, like, how could you just, like, uh. fuck, just, how could they not see it? How did they not realize? Uh, but it was a nice scene. Like, well, this this storyline needs to resolve, Toby. I'm, I'm serious. Let and them be happy. He's going, us, he's going to tease us for a minute of two or three more chapters with that. But uh, yeah. also, I can't help but notice that the the more that Susie tries to tries this new and uncomfortable being nice to people, or at least being unthreatening to people, role, that's a direct opposition. To Noel wanting to get wall slammed by Susie, and perhaps more than one slammed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. There is that wonderful moment when, like, when Noel accidentally sort of slips into fantasy about, like, oh, well, if I talk to Susie, maybe, maybe she would like push me to the ground, and 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 hmm, what were we saying? <laughs> yes, yes. To the ground, you say. <laughs> oh God. Baby gaze, yes. People are saying in chat, baby gaze. It's adorable. It's so cute. It's so silly and cute, and I love it so much. Uh, but we have to move on to a less pleasant topic now, which is uh, Birdly. Yeah, Birdly. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, God, I hate Birdly. And the reason why I hate Birdly is because I have been birdly like just 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 to be clear about that. Like when I'm going to when I'm going to rag on this kid right now, it's because I have been that guy and that's not a good guy to be. You shouldn't be that guy. Cool boy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in more than one way, Burley represents like the, just the awkward moment in, in in male adolescence where you're trying to be as present yourself as confident and competent as possible, and then you just end up like Burley. Yeah. Yeah. Burley is like. Birdly is is an interesting. I I kind of like the way that he's portrayed too because he gets this sort of tragic backstory moment that's supposed to humanize him and make us feel a little bit of sympathy for him, but the way that it's presented is framed very, very deftly as, like, barely anything happens. Like, it's not like he goes through some ma massive trauma or some, like, so some deep emotional storyline that prompts him to finally open up. The, literally, the only thing that happens is he can't solve a puzzle. Like, the only thing that happens is he's mildly embarrassed, and then he breaks out into this sob story about, I, I once experienced the joy of being considered intellectual, and I have been addicted to this rare pleasure. Like, he goes into this whole Shakespearean monologue about how hard it is to be him, and, like, sort of, he does admit to some vulnerability. He does admit to, like, yeah, it's like I'm, I'm putting on an act here but it's handled in a way where it's like yeah we can feel sympathy for him but clearly we're not supposed to just excuse his behavior from it which i appreciate because you shouldn't excuse that behavior you shouldn't you should hold people accountable for it yeah burnley burnley expertly straddles the line narratively between being a sympathetic character and a character you're supposed to have compassion for and obviously we don't go far enough 
to feel anything like compassion for him. We just understand where he's coming from because we've all been that, that egotistical little brat thinking that, that, that being a victim of their own ego makes for Shakespearean drama. Yeah. And like, and, and like, it's, it's even worse because like, he, he's wearing a fucking Saiyan suit. Like, he's clearly wearing, like, an a, a fucking scouter and, like, an anime yep. combat uniform. And it's the kind of thing is, like, I just know, like, if, if it if it had me a 13, that's the OC I would have designed for myself. Like, I would have. I would have. I would have designed that OC for myself, and I would have been absolutely equally insufferable. And it's terrible. I hate it. I hate this mirror you've put in front of me, Toby Fox. Take it away. We didn't want to be reminded of our terrible pasts. <laughs> But we were reminded of it nonetheless. It hurts just as we thought it would. And therefore, therefore, I'm not I'm not too surprised that everybody felt guilty pressing a certain button in a certain route. But damn, man, this guy's <laughs> annoying. Yeah, yeah, and but I do think there is a point to that. Like I do think there is a point to Birdly being quite as insufferable that he is, as he is. First of all, because it means like he relates naturally to Noel in the sense that Noel is like maybe the one person in the world who's enough of a doormat that he can walk all over her with like with his ego trips. Like so, in that sense, their relationship makes a certain degree of sense. But also, it also it adds a certain kind of like it adds something to again we'll get into snowgrave later but it adds something to it when you can make the decisions that you make in snowgrave which to me feels a little bit undertale in the way that it's sort of holding up mirror saying is like is this what you wanted are like you are you sure? sure this is what you wanted <laughs> like <laughs> is that how you wanted to resolve this are you certain like it adds a little bit of something to to it that there is there is this temptation to hurt him, uh, which <laughs> if, if you've watched my uh, playthrough of Dental Rune Chapter 2, I spend the entire fight with Birdly just going, this is a pacifist playthrough. It's a pacifist playthrough. This is a pacifist playthrough. I can't hurt him. It's a pacifist. <laughs> You're supposed to spare. Yeah. Spare. Spare, not kill. Yeah. Stay good. Stay good. But like, like as was mentioned in the game, especially by Queen, who like in many cases reflects Birdly's attitude towards Noel. There's nothing inherently like truly evil about this stupid dude. No, it's really, really irritating. He's just very annoying. So many levels and egotistical, but he's not evil. Like he's not, he's not cruel ever. Like he never does something out of cruelty. He's clearly, he's clearly the differentiation between an antagonist versus an actual like evil in the game. Right? Like you're not driven to get rid of him because he's going to cause so much trauma and damage and everything else to the world around him you just kind of wish he wasn't in the way so often yeah which uh, leads us on naturally i think to the villain of the piece sort of technically which is queen and this is again where we come back to the relationship with noel where queen seems very much to be a reflection of like we learn from noel's father that noel's mother is well-meaning like she's not she's not an evil abusive woman or anything but she's someone who is very can be very domineering who can be very sort of very particular about the expectations that she has for Noel and all the things that she wants Noel to do. And Queen is an interesting villain in that sense because like while the villain of the first game, the king, he was like he was pretty much an unmitigated scumbag. Like he was he was just a piece of shit. He was an asshole and there's some emotional complexity to him yeah. a little bit, but he was an asshole. You don't feel bad about kicking his ass. Like he gets put in hamster jail and it's fine. Um Queen on the other hand is not an actively malicious villain. Like she's not someone who's trying to destroy the world or or like subjugate everyone under her will. She's someone who has who has like looked out at the world and gone, well, everyone seems so fucking unhappy on the internet all the time. I should do something about this and make everyone happy, whether they want me to or not. Like she has this Strictly motivation speaking, that like, is in fact subjugating her them to her will. Yeah. But she thinks it's it's the common like AI, rapid AI situation where the AI thinks that that is, in fact, the best possible solution to all this unhappiness in the world, right? Yeah, she's an algorithm that has determined that, like, in the same way that the Twitter algorithm determines that you want to see these tweets, even though those tweets are the most heinous things you've ever laid eyes on in your entire life, and thus you engage with them. She's someone who has decided, well, I know what's best for everyone, so I'm going to do what's best for everyone because it's best for everyone, which is why her relationship with Noelle is not, do as I say, you impertinent child, but is, Noelle, my darling, my sweetheart, my little pumpkin poo. 
<laughs> I made you pie. Yeah, like she, 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 like she's very, very affectionate about Noelle and very protective of her, but also is like, no, no, Noelle, I have decided what we shall do. Come with me. <laughs> And like, and like doesn't take no for an answer, doesn't really know how to take no for an answer, which again, it feels very reflective of like Noelle having a difficult relationship with her mother, where her mother isn't evil or cruel to her or mean to her, just not a attentive smother. in a very particular way. It's just a bit of a smother, that's all. Yeah. Um, I do want to point out something potentially disturbing though. If, if the characters in the dark world are supposed to be reflections of the real world, and the queen's supposed to be a clear and uh, clear representation of Noel's mother, and the relationship between Lancer and the king is supposed to be reflective uh, of Subzi's situation. Yeah. What does that actually say about the relationship between the queen and the king? Yeah, good question there. I don't know if, if it's necessarily going to be that literal, but there's definitely. I guess the other thing about chapter one is like, if if you take. Susie's relationship with Lancer and especially with like the way that she relates to Lancer's dad as sort of reflective of how she relates to parental figures in general. Oh boy. Um, there's some lyrics there. I'm not sure if, I don't think we have enough details to confirm anything either way yet, but definitely at the end of chapter two and how she relates to Lancer. That raises some very interesting questions about how the uh, real world situation is reflected on. Yeah, definitely. Um, right. Let's see. Whom else must we discuss here? What do we have in our notes? Oh, right. We wanted to talk about uh, monster designs. Some of the some of the enemy designs yeah. that are, and there actually aren't that many new enemies in uh, in Delta Rune Chapter Two. There's only like there's only like eight or nine, I think, enemy types that you that you can really fight. But I quite like the wear wire as an introduction to the world because it's like. It's yeah, it's sort of silly and cartoony, but it's also really kind of disturbing, like yeah, hanging um, from the ceiling, like jiggling on these wires that are like attached to their face, like a face hugger. Yeah, the very moment we enter this world, we're met with a whole bunch of like small, short, cute little things that are basically supposed to be like a representation of the ordinary folks ar around in the uh, in the world too, right? And then they get wired up. Yeah, they turn into these cute little fuzzy innocent, innocent things. Turn into literal mind zombies. Though that may be unfair because we actually talk to a wear wire later on, and they prefer being what they are, uh, what they are with the wire attached. Yeah, it, it's sort of, it's sort of, it, it's very horrifying at first, but then they sort of, they sort of pull it back a little bit and go, no, 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 it's not quite as body horror as it seems. It, it's still pretty horrific, given that the queen is literally transforming them into this. Yeah, but some of those transformations are voluntary, and they apparently still have their minds. Yeah, but it's a it's a really cool enemy design. Like it's and generally, this is the thing about like uh, character design in 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 Undertale and Delta Rune is like it's so varied. Like it's so varied. It's so different. There are so many different like like aesthetics that are brought in for these characters that like I really just appreciate that. Like, if, if you're gonna have this this JRPG, if you're gonna have this pixel art style, then fuck it, let's just let's just do the swatchling, very sort of pointy, triangular, weird, plague doctor mask looking things, and these cool '90s robots from some PSA about how kids how kids it's not cool to do drugs or whatever, and a mouse wheel, and this whatever the hell this sort of vaccine <laughs> creature, the ambulance is. I I, re I really do appreciate that. Uh, we could talk about the robots for a second, just because like, what a great trio these kids like they're, yeah. they're clearly they're speakers like they're literally the speakers on a computer turned into characters um and then to turn them into like this extremely 90s sort of of <laughs> like mascot characters I, I i found them like they're not important but they are kind of they're just kind of wonderful i, I was happy every time they were on screen because yeah, they're silly and beating them involves dancing yeah like there's nothing like Probably the only annoying thing is having to run through their uh, attack patterns over and over again, trying to figure out how you're supposed to get past the game. Uh, but, like, that was ultimately fun. It was a nice change of pace. And definitely, they were extremely different from everything else in the game so far, right? In fact, they're so different that they don't really show up except for the segments directly involving them and at the very end. Uh, that's that's not uncommon with, with uh, Toby Fox's game so far, I think. What... 
I kind of think is happening here though is that they are in fact mascot characters, right? Like usually when you go to a library, especially with the uh, especially with the computer lab, right? You you're going to see a whole bunch of like motivational posters and everything else. And you're right, they look exactly like as if they came from '90s era of motivational posters. Yeah, and they it, really it's do. It's probably no coincidence whatsoever that you find them that this is in fact supposed to be a representation of the library setting. Yeah, because the computer is probably from the '90s, which also ties into the favorite year of one of the more important characters later in 1997 because they look like some 1997 ass character designs to me yep uh some people yep. in, in chat right uh, brought up the task uh, manager let me just see if i can oh god uh, i got assets be behave <laughs> there we go who like don't don't google so, her without safe search on by the way don't yeah. don't don't do that because because it's not safe. It's not safe at all. <laughs> um, but I quite like both the task and the task manager. Um, like uh, th those, like as again being this computer themed haha thing. But where the tasks, like literally, like they look, they have an aesthetic that really makes them look like diskettes, basically, and like make them look like computer icons. And like to have the task manager then literally be essentially a lion tamer, I think is a very clever little conceit. The dangerous thing was making the task at, was making this task badger looking like a maid. Yeah, like th that was a deliberate design choice. Yeah, <laughs> to give her a, to give her a dress, make her a maid, and give her a whip. I was definitely Toby Fox messing with us. I think to put it safely. Yeah, I mean it's it's well, I I think the man knows what he's doing. <laughs> although, Absolutely. Although no one can control the internet, like uh once it gets there, but boy, howdy. Yeah, that, that one's a popular character with the fandom for <clears throat> reasons that we'll not, we'll not, uh, we'll not dive in too deep on here. Right, uh, let me see our notes. What I else we are a lot of Delta Room fans that want to be managed by that tax manager, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Let's move on to Chris and their particular place in the game because oh shit didn't mean to do that whoops um because chris is another like as, as a protagonist they're interesting especially through the lens of undertale especially through the lens of oh god i've messed everything up um i'm working on some stuff behind this especially through the lens of undertale especially through the lens of like if we know we know what undertale was about as a game was specifically was this meta interrogation of hey if you're going around in the jrpg killing everyone for experience points hey maybe that makes you evil like no matter whether or not you defeat the villain at the end like maybe that's a bad thing like it, it had these sort of meta textual interrogations of the role of the player in a video game like if you're playing this game and you're taking these actions what does that do what does that mean in terms of who you are as a character um and why does that turn the whole thing black okay i don't know um and so chapter two there is this tension between we are controlling chris most of the time but then there's those times when we're not controlling chris and that's handled in one of two ways. There's the very obvious way, the time when we're not controlling Chris, which is when Chris tears their heart out of their chest and like locks it away somewhere and it can't mess with them anymore. And then Chris goes off and does something on their own. But then there's also the other times, which is usually when it's Ralsei who prompts him to say, hey, Chris, why don't you close your eyes and think of what Susie is doing or what Noel is doing? Why don't we just fade the player perspective to some other location and then invariably when you fade back to Chris and Ralsei Chris and Ralsei seem to be having a conversation that you didn't hear um that's also another reason why everybody's suspicious of, of the little fuzzy boy right yeah like he does this in both chapters so far and like we really really need to know what's going on there to like have a have a good sense of like what Chris is incentives are why they are doing what they are when they're tearing the hearts out of uh, of the souls and why it happens to involve creating more dark worlds right yeah in the sense that the sense that ralph is the only one that actually is able to communicate with w consequences of making all these dark fountains is that it's exasperated by the fact that chris happens to be the cause of all these dark fountains too so mm -hmm. 
I'm not sure if they're necessarily in direct conflict because it's not as if Chris attacks, uh, I'll say, given the opportunity to do so when they're literally left alone with each other with no with no player intervention. Yeah. But I definitely don't get a sense that they're necessarily allies, right? Yeah. It's interesting because Chris is both the, the, the nominal protagonist of the game and the antagonist as the roaring knight, as the person who constantly like creates it like who constantly creates the inciting incident for the action of each chapter by creating the dark fountain and forcing care players to sort of deal with 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 the with the impact of this world and the thing is like what's interesting is that that's not like inherently malicious like it's not really that chris is doing an evil thing when they do that like opening the dark fountain like bringing the roaring and destroying the world, uh, which which Ralsei sort of lets us know that if there's too many dark fountains, then everyone's gonna be fucking destroyed in an apocalypse. But the actual, like, whenever, when they open the dark fountain in the library, they, like, everyone kind of has a good time <laughs> like, yeah. it, it, going through the dark world. Like, it's, so I'm wondering if there's a thing where it's like with Susie that Chris is opening these dark fountains because that's the only place where, like, finally they get to be a hero. Which is the thing is, like, I, we know that Asriel is the golden boy. Asriel is the one with all the with all the trophies, and Chris clearly wants those trophies. Chris clearly wants that decoration and wants that sort of acknowledgement because that's in their room in Ralsei's dark world. Like, that's that's where they get to have everything they want, and clearly they want to be the hero. Clearly they want like. I think there is like a clear indication that they want this, so maybe that's the reason why they're making them, so that they can keep playing the hero over and over and over and over again. And where that becomes malicious is that, hey, you know, maybe you shouldn't fuck other people's lives up so much just because you want to play, kiddo. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a sense of course, uh, course development and what Chris is doing, right? Uh, what Chris is doing, just making fantasy worlds, ultimately. Yeah, he comes off he comes off as really really creepy, only because the times we actually see Chris in motion. Uh, we're going to block that name right away. Hold on. Oh, hello. Yeah, I see it. I see it. Yeah. Anyhow, yeah, the only times we actually see Chris in command of his own self are also times that he, to put it in perspective, he effectively has his strings cut as a puppet, right? He's yeah. no longer under... Uh, no, I keep on saying he, but Chris is actually supposed to be... It's not actually defined either way. He's it, It's non-binary. Yeah, Chris, they're non-binary characters. When they have their strings cut and are limping around as if they don't have full control over their, over their own body. And that makes them creepy to us. And they're certainly hostile to who we are. Yeah, but in relation to the rest of the world, the worst you can say is that they happen to be really quiet and disturbing. Yeah, that's the thing. Is like, cause like what we hear about Chris's behavior otherwise is that they've never done anything like evil or anything, but like they play pranks on Noel a lot, and apparently seem to have a lot of fun doing that. Or, and like they seem to have trouble relating to people. But everyone that we've heard met so far and talked to also seems to indicate that Chris actually has a really good relationship with Asriel. Like, that Asriel and Chris spend a lot of time together, they like they, they hang out together, they do a lot of stuff together. And in Chris's room, in in uh, Queen's mansion, when, when, when Queen makes this ideal room um, for Chris, one of the things that, that we get to see there is that there's this computer where Chris apparently has been searching over and over and over again for when is college holiday is coming like when 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 does my brother get to come home from university because that's clearly weighing on their mind a lot so there's this thing of like where the framing and the visuals like when chris tears their heart out of their chest and then brandishes a knife we all go uh and like glowing red eyes those are the visual signifiers of evil like those are the visual <laughs> signifiers of fucking kara from undertale like that that's everyone who's ever played undertale goes ah god oh god it's the evil one it's oh this, boy like it's uh um but then the only thing Chris really does with that knife is open a fountain and slash Toriel's tires. That one admittedly is a little bit, that's a little much. A bit, uh, a bit much. A bit much. Also, we also know that the knife's only, uh, yeah, as, as Chad has mentioned, uh, the only other time the knife's been used other than to cause mischief with tires or to open up worlds in uh, new dimensions is to 
eat pie. Yeah. And that's a really, that's a really innocent thing to do with a knife. Yeah, they, they used the knife to cut pie and also to open the fountain in, 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 in the library. I <laughs> think. And we also know that when Chris is in full control of themselves, that the people that actually know Chris have no reason to doubt him or to be afraid of him, of, of them, right? Yeah. Like, no, as we mentioned earlier, Noel's entire relationship with Chris is that of two childhood friends. Yeah, they've been neighbors for so long and they've been through so much together, Noel says. And yet, Noel doesn't quite feel like they're necessarily friends, just that, like, they're definitely part of each other's lives. Like, somebody you've, kn you've known for a long time, but have had a falling out or have distanced yourself from for some reason. Yeah. Like, and again, like, going back to what we know about, like, Noelle and Susie in terms of, of uh, like, reflections of their family life, what we know about Chris's life is that, first of all, they're from a religious household. Like, there's books of hymns and Toriel, like, there's this Christian rock lying around, like, things like that. Um, and they go to church a lot. Um, so, like, there's that. And we also know that they are from a broken marriage. Like, Toriel and Asgore are no longer together. And Asgore is being a bit of a sad sack about it. Um, overall, and Toriel clearly has a lot of anger towards Asgore. Like, oh, a yeah. lot of, of, a lot of resentment and anger to, towards Asgore. To the point where when Asgore sends her flowers, she just throws them in the trash, like, directly. Even though Chris was the one who brought them home. Um... And that sort of broken home thing, well, not a broken home as such, but, like, because Toriel is clearly a loving mother, but that, that like, uh, oh, mom and dad don't love each other anymore thing, like, that's a traumatic thing for any child, and I wonder if maybe some of what Deltarune is going to be about is, like, this is Chris trying to process that part of their life, that, like, that their mom and dad are no longer together, which is, like, a tough thing. And how they choose to process it too, which probably ties into the whole motif of like destroying the world, which might entirely be metaphorical about so many angels, which also might be met might be met metaphorical for authority figures and stuff like that. Like clearly, there's some there's some internal conflict going on that's being expressed in a more psychotropic sense with the under with the uh, Delta Room settings. But whatever caused that trauma isn't something that's Toby's telling us yet. Not yet, Only no. hinting at throughout the game. And the other thing about angels, which is like the thing of like, like this is, and we'll talk about uh, Captain Special Deal in just a little bit. Um, but the thing is like, when, when there's these references to angels in heaven, I really do think that it is very specifically references to the fact that Chris comes from a Christian household, like comes from a religious household, that there is this, this, this aspect of Chris's thinking that's influenced by religion. Like, if we take the Dark Worlds as in some way a reflection of Chris's will, of the Chris's determination, that, that like, the, the references to angels and, 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 and heaven and stuff, and, like, Spamton trying to reach heaven and, and reach this kind of freedom, and just the question of being free in general, like, I think that's going to relate somehow to the religious aspects of Chris's experience. And we got a super chat here from uh, Telling Tale. What if Chris isn't looking forward to Ac Asriel's return, but in fact dreading it? A scene where their shared room, Asriel has it all and Chris has nothing. That's the other thing, right? Like, it, maybe it's maybe it's that. Maybe it's that, that Chris is very desperately trying to make a life for themselves outside of their brother's shadow before their brother comes back and ruins everything. Like, maybe that's why they're so desperate to open all these fountains right now, is because they want to end the world before brother comes home. Like, or it could be both. Like, it could be that there's a complicated relationship where Chris misses their brother a lot, but also kind of hates having them around. Could be either way. Having siblings, I know what that is like. Uh, sometimes you love them. Often you just kind of wish they left you alone. Sometimes... You love them, and you also really, really, really hate the, the, their involvement. Yeah. That's, family family is complicated. Family is a contradictory thing. Uh, but we do know that it, like, the only thing we know absolutely for sure is what is, it was what was demonstrated through, through uh, Queen's Room with Chris, right? That they are constantly uh, looking for information regarding Asriel, constantly checking when Asriel is going to be back. And that's... That drives a lot of whatever underlying motive is behind their action. Yeah, like it, it, it certainly it seems to. Okay, those I think are sort of the main 
main storylines, but of course there's more than one storyline in this particular game, and uh, the other storyline that we do have to talk about is, uh... Yeah. Snowgrave, which is the other thing. Like, it's also known as the weird route, but it's the other thing that can happen when you go through Deltarune Chapter 2, which is that you meet up with Noel in the cyber world, and while Chris and Noel are the only ones walking around together, if you make Noel defeat all of the enemies with ice, all of them, every single one, you can eventually begin to manipulate her actions because every time you win a battle by having Noel kill, well, defeat enemies, let's say that, with her ice powers, there's this little pop-up that comes up at the bottom that says Noel grew stronger. Noel got stronger. Noel got stronger every time. And as you force Noel to do this more and more, Noel becomes kind of emotionally dependent on Chris and more and more obedient towards Chris to the point where she starts doing some things that are wrong. <laughs> Just straight up, like she steals yeah. a ring because Chris tells them to, uh, tells her to. Um, and eventually when you find Spamton hiding in, in his dumpster and you buy the thorn ring from him, which you can only do once you've frozen every enemy, Noel gets access to a new power called Snowgrave. And the only place you can use, well, you can use that actually against normal enemies as well if, if you mess around a bit, but the place where you're supposed to use it, air quotes, is when you encounter Birdly. And Noel doesn't seem to recognize him at first. Like, oh, that's an enemy. Shall I freeze them? And no uh, Birdly kind of has to snap her out of it. Hey, Noel, hi, I'm your friend. Don't you remember me? And then they get into combat, and Chris can force push Noel to use Snowgrave to murder Birdly, to kill him. Like, the ability says this ability is fatal, and when you exit the Dark World after having defeated the final boss, Birdly is lying, sleeping? Question mark? Uh, on, we, like, with we, his head on the table in the library, and is not awake, is all the game will tell you. Uh, um, to call this the weird route, unders uh, undersells a little bit, it's more like a traumatizing route. And also... It's one of the major breaks from the overall theme of the game, right? Chad has mentioned how this part of the game feels feels like you're breaking the game itself. You're not entirely wrong. Your actions aren't supposed to matter. Your actions in the dark world in this instance has a real has what appears to be real world consequences. Yeah. Although it doesn't change the state of the very end of the game, uh, it absolutely changes the circumstances of Chris's world around them, right? Yeah, and Noelle also seems to be a different character by the end of, of, of like, it, as you go through the Snow Grave Rav, more and more, like, Noelle keeps coming up with these rationalizations. No, 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 Chris isn't, Chris, Chris is not trying to hurt me. They're just trying to, they're just making me stronger. I'm just, I'm just becoming stronger. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just becoming a stronger person who can do more things, and that's good. So this is, this is fine. This is probably okay. Um, and interestingly, by the end of Snowgrave, when, once you return to the real world, Noelle behaves very differently. Because, like, in, in the normal route, she's pretty much just herself. She's still nervous. She's still sort of a, this a bubbly, nerdy girl character. But after Snowgrave, she comes out, and she's noticeably more assertive and confident, but also noticeably terrified of Chris. Yeah. Um... She might have come out of her show in some sense, but doing so almost seems as if it's a way to deal with uh, whatever fears or nightmares that she was uh, going through while she was purportedly asleep. Yeah, it's like, it's, and, and just the way that Chris pushes Noelle into doing things, like the way that, that Noelle just sort of keeps like having these blackouts where she, where she clearly is blocking out the memory of what she's done because Chris told her to. And just the, like the way that Chris initially, like the way that Chris initially manipulates her is essentially with like these sort of semi-romantic gestures of saying, oh, I shall ride on, uh, you will ride with me on the Ferris wheel and I will get you this ring. We're going to get you this ring. Like there's this sort of, quasi-romantic aesthetic to the manipulation early on that's just like, oh, these are kids! Holy shit, Toby Fox! Yeah. It's yeah. like... We were, 
We weren't exactly expecting to be grooming a kid into a mass murder over the course of a Toby Fox game. Although maybe we should, we should have expected that to some sense. Yeah, it's like, it's, it's incredibly dark, like the way that Chris manipulates them and the way that like Chris, Chris is just like, like recedes into, into this one word vocabulary of just proceed, proceed, yes. proceed, like go, do it, do it, do the thing, do it. Do it now. Do it because I tell you to. Like, and becomes, wow, deeply, desperately, profoundly creepy. Like, I can't play Snowgrave. I've watched a playthrough. I will not play through it because I don't, even if it's just fiction, like, that's just, that's too much for me. I don't want to do that. Um, it, asks, it asks you, it gives you a countdown on how many more people you have to kill in order to unlock the route. That's, that's a bit much. But also, we keep on saying Chris does this and Chris does that, but I also can't help but notice it's not Chris doing this. No, we have it's to us. Oh, yeah. We have to make the deliberate choice to seduce Noel and convince her to do these things. And we have to convince her that's ordinary and, and understandable to think murderous thoughts, even in our direction. Yeah, like there's a point where, where like Noel is like, has this internal battle with herself feeling guilty that she fantasized for a moment about letting Chris be electrocuted by a trap and Chris can hear that because Chris is the player and rather we can hear that and we can tell her no no that's natural that's normal that's okay you should think that, that way all the time and that comes back to the relationship between Chris and the player because when you're playing the normal route what you're doing with Chris is like you're fixing the, like you're fixing the bad stuff that Chris is doing when they're not under your control, right? Like they, they go around, they open these dark fountains, then you as a player go around and try and fix that for them. And when you're controlling Chris, like multiple other characters comment over and over again that you seem different, Chris. Like you seem to be acting different. You seem to be more friendly. You seem to be, like you seem to be more acceptable to us. Like they, they sort of react positively to Chris being less of a creepy weirdo than usual. Um, And so one way to interpret that is that like, is that when you take control of Chris on one route, you're trying to do what's best for them. Like you're essentially forcing them into behaving in a way that is what you would sort of, what, what like a mother would normally consider good for them. Like go out, socialize, make some friends, go on some adventures, like do some stuff, be kind to people, be nice, like help people with their problems. Like all the good stuff, all the, all the stuff we're sort of usually think of as good. But when you're going on the weird route, you're pushing Chris into doing just heinous things and there oh, you're correct. not doing it you're not really doing it because you're doing what like it and again this is this thing with queen like queen is doing what's best for everyone whether they want it or not and so is the player like um on on the good route and on the evil route that's more in the sense of undertale like undertale is very much this game that calls you out if you go the genocide route multiple times you're gonna get called out by the characters like you're doing this just for fun like you're doing this just because you want to see what happens you're killing these people you're causing all this suffering because you want to see what happens because you think it's fun are you sure you feel good about that and snowgrave feels very much <clears throat> in that vein to me because you're doing this to noel because why? Be just because she can. Like, just, uh, let's just, let's just do it for fun. Let's see what happens. Like, it feels like that same brand of, <clears throat> of, like, 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 unempathetic sociopathic nihilism of, like, who cares? It's a video game. I can make them do whatever the fuck I want, and I don't care what consequences it is, has for these fictional characters that I'm making them do this. So there is this... I think it's good. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think there is... darker and darker. Yeah. It becomes more and more interesting to the player. I wonder where we've heard those terms before. Yeah. Darker and darker, deeper and deeper. Yeah, it's... Oh, boy. I, like, So I think, like, in terms of, like, if relating it back to Undertale, I think it's examining some of the same stuff about the relationship between someone who plays a character and someone who has to live as a character. Like, like... That, like the responsibility you have as a person who has agency o over someone else's decisions and behaviors. But boy, howdy, it goes harder than Undertale, and Undertale had a route called genocide. Like, oh, Lord. Yeah, it's, it's kind of one thing, right? In terms of video games, even if, even if you're playing the genocide route, you realize that you're, you're, what you're playing is a deterministic route of, like, Mur like a murder simulator just to just to see what happens to the world if you kill enough but this delta rune asks us 
to groom somebody in that direction. That feels like it's crossing multiple lines. Yeah, we're not even and the ones doing the killing. We're making someone else do it for us, which is like, again, oh. It's like, there's not even like, it's not as if you unlock a particularly difficult, like extra optional boss by going through this route, right? Although there are changes to the overall end state of the game. It's not as you're fighting Sans because it happens to be the most dramatic music. It happens to have the the uh, best overall like fight patterns. No, you're 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 doing it for a narrative point. You're doing it because you're curious what happens if you happen to turn this little girl into a monster. Yeah. Yeah, it's oh lord. But that leads us does lead us into Spamton, who is both the sort of the silliest character in the game with his a weird thought pattern where he talks like this and then eventually goes into a robot voice when the hyperlink is blocked. Like, he is sort of the weird, saney, wacky, weirdo character. But then also, he is very, especially in the Snowgrave route, because he's the one who sells you the ring that gives Noel the ability to use Snowgrave. Like, he's the one who, he helps you do that. Very specifically, he helps you do that, and he comments that he helps you do that. Like, he says, yeah, I helped you do that thing, and therefore you owe me a debt. We're partners, you and I, and then when you try to close the fountain, he gets mad at you and attacks you as the final boss of Snowgrave. But on the on the normal route, you have to find him as a secret optional boss that's entirely optional. And Spamton seems to be obsessed with... Like he, he calls it becoming a big shot, but what he actually wants is to be free. Like, he feels controlled, he feels deeply unfree, and he wants freedom. He wants to be freed from his strings to go and do as he please, essentially. That seems to be his whole thing. And that relates to Chris in another interesting way, I think. Um, when you actually manage to beat the Spanton and cut off his strings... The act of him losing control as a puppet greatly disturbs the character itself. And by the character, I don't mean you, right? I mean, Chris themselves has a violently negative reaction to Spanton's strings getting cut. Yeah. As if they realize that uh, that's their fate as well if they manage to depose of the, of the player. Yeah, if they get rid of the soul. <laughs> yeah, because that's the thing is like, whenever Chris tears out the heart, they're tearing their own soul out of the body, basically. Uh, that's what the heart is, it's the soul. And, yeah, as you say, like, it seems to be that when Spamton's strings are cut, and that kills Spamton. Like, Chris seems to take that essentially as a kind of trauma. As though it's a confirmation that, that Chris can never, ever be free. Which is like, damn. Oh, uh, there's a super chat. This route makes me think that Hyperlink Blocked is love, because in his fight, Spamton asks, you and her have been making Hyperlink love, Hyperlink Blocked, haven't you? Well, yeah, making love, not as in the sense of, of, like, sex, but making love in the sense of, as it's defined in Undertale, love as an expression of your power, level of violence, as it stands for, which is, which, which like, is an Undertale thing about, yes. like, your, your capacity for hurting other people. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the double entendre is in itself kind of funny. Yeah. It's disturbing for, for, for and the fucked kids up. involved. <laughs> but absolutely, we have, in fact, been making exorbitant levels of violence in this game through the weird route. Yeah. Uh, through the weird route, rather. And yeah, and, and, and it's exactly what he wanted us to do in the first place. What, uh, what Spanta wanted us to do in order to shake up the world, in order to overwrite the rules like that, that he thinks are keep are tying him down. Yeah, and like Spamton seems obsessed with that. Like that's the whole thing about being a big shot. To him, seems to be a thing about like being free to do what you want. And that's the other thing. Like that's I don't know if I'm reading too much into this, but it seems to me interesting. Therefore, like that he constantly has this refrain of hyperlink blocked. Like, he's, he's a spam bot who is from the 90s that's been stymied by, you know, the advent of modern cybersecurity. Like, he can't do what he wants anymore. He's constantly being fettered um, by, like, the realities of modern computing. And so what he wants is essentially to, like, to he's essentially a, a virus in that sense um, who just wants to go and infect things. Uh, worse than that is I think hyperlink block may actually have multiple meanings, right? Yeah. Because the most obvious service level reading of it is actually, well, no, not even service level, but um, given what 
Bathos told of the background involvement with him and what the NPCs in the castle has told us about him. Hyperlink block may literally mean literally mean a hyperlink to whatever agent, uh, whatever malicious agent was directing his actions before we were actually in the world. Yeah, because Bampton received a phone call of some kind. He got a call. Um, and that apparently put him on top for a while. Like, that for a while, he became very, very successful and popular because of the aid of this unseen agent. Um, and now, being, like, reduced to sleeping in a dumpster, having lost all of his friends and, and everything, that seems to be what's dri driving him to be the way that he is. Um, and there are these little hints of, like, a really deeply tragic, broken personality inside him that you get in various bits. Like, there's a... I think we actually have a screenshot of this, if I can find it. Yeah, we have this. I'm just going to move out of the way for a second. Um, this little bit of dialogue that happens in his shop, just for a second, where he is, his eyes turn into static and he just... Can anyone hear me? help the first time that he has spoken in lowercase at any point in the game, which sort of indicates that, like, for all of Spamton's loud sort of spam bot affect, the way that he talks, that there might be some serious shit going on on the inside, which again comes through when, when we see in the, like, what you're seeing on the screen right now is the optional boss battle in the, in the good route, where you can go and find him and put him into this Spamton Neo body, which imitates an angel, and he sort of he sort of thinks that this power will allow him to break free, and you can tear the strings off that doll, and then he falls down and he can't get back up. And that's the only other time, like once you defeat him and talk to him, that's the only other time that he becomes able to talk normally just for a second before he turns into an item um, and and vanishes forever. And depending on how you beat him, it could be any it could be multiple items with very different implications as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, but it should be noted that that even as he was helping us destroy the world in the Snowgrave route, I don't think he was necessarily expecting how it ended. Because the end of Snowgrave route still ends up with his defeat. And ends up with his defeat in the hands of what he has helped create. Yeah. Like, literally, there are two characters in the entire game that actually get Snowgraved. Uh, one is Birdly, and the other one happens to be the one that gave us the ring in the first place. Yeah, Spamton. And those raise questions, though, like... He's obviously... The tragedy of Spamton is obviously that he has been manipulated into being what he was. Yeah. Which raises questions about how much of Snowgrave itself plays into into that meta, right? How much was that necessarily our, our choice? Or how much of that is is because the route was there for us to walk down? Yeah, that's the thing. Is like is like the person because we know this with Jevil as well in chapter one that Jevil seems to have talked to someone or been exposed to information from someone that drove Jevil kind of crazy. Like Jevil gained some kind of knowledge that fucked that fucked him up. And that's why he like he locked himself away and and like he's talking also a lot about freedom and about how you're not free. I'm free because I am like I'm not locked away from you. You're all locked away from me. I'm the one, only one who's free. Everyone else is locked outside of this room. Um, like he has that dialogue, and then Spamton continues that like this obsession with freedom, which seems to have been precipitated by a mysterious contact with someone who might be named Mike, uh, for all we know. But again, fan theory is yeah. speculation that like maybe Gaster has something to do with it. Um, yeah. Especially since, like, Spamton is so uh, obsessed with obtaining a soul, a, determ a soul with determination. Yeah. And, like, a lot of that is hinted by the, by the, uh, by the rather metaphorical dialogue from uh, Spamton himself. Uh, there will be no more miracles and there will be no more magic with both miracles and magic in brackets. You lost it when you tried to see too far. Yeah. And by you lost, it means he lost. So, there is something about knowing too much that expo like destroys the concept of miracles and magic for the game and these are metaphorical concepts right just as if just as our uh, big shot doesn't necessarily mean like the literal interpretation as we understand it and how hyperlink text or hyperlink blocked isn't a website address but more of a connection between a uh, deeper mystery right yeah so what miracles and magic might mean 
I assume that's metaphorical for the uh, the meta of the uh, meta textual aspects of the game, right? How within the game itself, you have mir miraculous uh, moments, you have magic abilities, you have the miracle of choice leading to certain results. But once you see too far, you lose the sense of mystery involved, and you lose the sense of narrative. Yeah. And there's also some tie-in there, like, in terms of no more miracles, no more magic, that's also, like, where can characters use magic only in the dark world? Right? So, like, it's it also seems to relate just to, this, to again, the psychotropic nature of the landscape of the setting. It's interesting. Like, it's it's an interesting thing. And I do think, like, my take on Spamton and Jevil and all sort of the all sort of this like greater mystery backstory stuff like the um like the uh, bunker at the bottom of the town that like clearly something happened there but you don't know what. Oh yeah. All of that is to yeah. me like I'm I'm sort of of the opinion that any sort of game theory style speculation of ah we have decoded what the thing means right now. No, no. Wait till for that. Yeah, it's it's kind of it's kind of useless um because we won't know jack shit until, like, until the last chapter is out, I think. Like, we'll probably we'll be able to figure some stuff out sooner. But right now, I think it's too early days to really fully say... In the same way that it's too early days to say exactly what the relationship between Chris and Asriel is right now. Because we have a lot of implications, but it constantly is this thing of it could go either way. And I feel like Spamton and Jevil and, like, those deeper mysteries... That's all kind of the same thing. It's like, it's stuff that's sort of fun to talk about, but I don't think you can come to any useful conclusions yet. Um, I would say that everything, all the deeper mystery stuff have, so far have merely been signposts to suggest that there is something there. It doesn't yeah. actually give us a proper shape or understanding. Like, even with even with the mystery for uh, for Noel and Desi, for instance, all we know is that something, something happened that happens to be traumatic. And that's kind of a given with these kind of stories, right? For yeah. there to be that kind of like signpost that something like something interesting happened and happens to have shaken up these characters obviously has to be something tragic. And yeah, to give we, us the name of the character involved doesn't actually tell us anything more than that. Yeah, that's the thing, is like Noel has a sister, December, who promised to take her to see the world, see the see the big city, see some great things. But everyone who talks about December, and not a lot of people do, seems to talk about her in a sort of past tense in a sort of past tense. Not that she's definitely dead, we certainly haven't found her grave, but that something happened to her and that she's not around anymore. And again, that's like, that's very interesting. And that certainly is, is something that's gonna like, when you think about like Noella's relationship, difficult relationship with her mother and things like that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Having a sister who's gone or dead or who abandoned the family maybe, like God knows what happened that's definitely going to impact how Noelle relates to her controlling mother, right? Like, it's it's stuff that all suggests interesting things, but it's I don't think we can go anywhere with it yet. Not yet. A lot of innuendo and subtext, not a whole lot of text. Yeah. And with that, I think we've sort of gone through the majority of the things that are there to talk about with Chapter 2. And to answer the question again in the title, yeah. Yeah, it was worth it. Holy shit, I want chapter three. I want chapter three so bad. I want to say, like, Toriel is in the dark world now. Like, he made it. He made the dark fountain in his own house, in their own house, with Toriel there, and 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 Susie's also there. Holy shit, I want to see what, what Toriel is like in the dark world. Like, I want to see what happens. Toriel is a playable character. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Playable Toriel. Playable Toriel! Yep, playable Toriel. And, um... I think it's also going to be impossible to involve discussions of, uh, like, I would be very, very surprised if Toriel's involvement also didn't include Sans. Yeah. Maybe through Sans, we finally figured out what a hell Pepper is in this world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like, uh, again, like, again, like, yeah, because, like, the, because going back to, to Toriel and, and Asgore and their relationship, like, we know Asgore used to be on the police force before he was a flower shop owner, a bad flower shop owner. Um, and we know he was removed from the police force and Undyne was put in charge instead. And Toriel's resentment of Asgore seems to have some connection to that, like have something to do with that. And so I'm wondering if, if Toriel is in the dark world this time, if the story is going to be about her, then I think the villain is going to be Asgore. Or at least a character in the same way that that Queen represents Noelle's mother, a character that represents Toriel's relationship with Asgore. And I just, oh, I'm curious. Oh, I want to see. Oh, boy. 
Oh, oh I want to know. <laughs> oh, that's going to be an interesting topic. Yeah. But what's worse is that we know there's going to be a weird route for chapter three as well. Yeah, I, I don't want that. Tutorial. I don't want that. I don't. I don't even want one. I don't want that. Toby it, Fox, you coming. bastard. It's coming. It's coming. It's oh gonna God, what's it going to make us do? Fucking hell. Anyway, uh, that's sort of the end of all of the talking points that we had prepared. So if everyone in chat has some questions or some things that they want to talk about, you are more than welcome to post them down below. Yes, please do. Send us the questions. And they don't have to be super chats, by the way. Just just thought I should bring that up. But if you wanted us to talk about some stuff during the main discussion, that was what the super chats are for. But you don't have to do super chats to ask questions. Um, so don't don't worry about that. Obviously, we appreciate any of the support you, uh, you're willing to show us, but also just like sending us questions as a form of support. Hmm. If Queen represents Noelle's mother, who does King represent? Okay, for, uh, my take is that King represents um, specifically Susie's relationship with parental figures. That was my take on on King. <clears throat> uh, that's the most obvious read for me as well. Um, there is some suggest suggestion that King might not be necessarily as bad as he presents himself in the in the first chapter, especially since like he has mentioned that Lancer can basically bounce out of anything and that you throw at him, right? So even tossing Lancer off a cliffside, Lancer will literally just bounce his way back up. I'm not sure how true that is. I'm not sure that King making excuses for his own behavior. Uh, a lot of the sort of justification comes from abusive parents as well. So yeah. obviously, take, that, that, oh, take he'll such be words. fine if I hit him like that kind of shit. Yeah. Also, like, the interaction between him and Queen suggests that Queen might agree that Lancer has that sort of resilience. Queen yeah. herself doesn't necessarily, like, necessarily come off, like, as, like, aggressive towards uh, towards uh, her kids, right? Rather, even, even, even in the case of Noelle, what she's trying to do is control their actions to make them safer rather than trust that they can handle whatever's being tossed at them. Yeah. Uh, Joaquin Caceres, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that really, asks if, what do you think about the theory that hyperlink blocked is choices? Like, so when he says, oh, you've been making hyperlink blocked, he's saying, if Spamton is saying, you've been making choices. That's possible. Like, that Spamton is so, so precluded from making decisions about his own existence that he can't even say the word i think that's possible i think that makes <clears throat> that makes perfect sense and like a lot of the bracket the word section reminds me of another game entirely a very very old game um what was it called it was a space game uh the uh, name will come to mind later. But the characters in there called the Ort spoke in metaphor metaphorical dialogue. And the translator you had in that game wasn't able to fully translate the concepts because they were so information dense. And in this case, I kind of feel like the, the intent is similar, if not directly inspired by by the uh, by the game I'm talking about. Uh, I'll figure it out later. Um, <laughs> in that in that the bracketed words mean more than one thing, and that's why they're bracketed, because they're otherwise they're otherwise not singular concepts, and they're otherwise not necessarily uh, non-ambiguous concepts either. So to say that hyperlink uh, blocked might also mean that your choices are blocked, I think that makes perfect sense as well. As much as love, as much as any other possible interpretation. Because whatever realm of angels, if oh yeah, Star Control 2, yes, Arquan Masters. Uh, Mugbear got, got exactly right. Uh... The whole point with with the uh, or dialogue in Star Control 2 was that the thing that they call dance could also be mating, could also mean violence and fighting. And I feel like a lot of that inspiration is being demonstrated here as well. And that whatever whatever hyperlink block might mean, it's it's multi-dimensional in the same way that we as a player are not bound by the limited two dimensions of the game, or that the angels presumably are higher dimension beings compared to the rest of the setting. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that's a fair interpretation. Uh, someone asks, do you think they'll further develop a connection between Undertale and Deltarune? I think, like, I think insofar as there is a connection between Undertale and Deltarune, it's thematic. And insofar as it exists in the plot, it's going to be like, like, in the same way that in Undertale, if you dive really deep into the code and if you get, like, the right fun value and the 160 hours, like, and you really dive into, like, 
really deep into the deepest recesses of that game, you find the story of Gaster and you find sort of you find sort of that stuff. But all of that stuff is not what Undertale is about. Like Undertale isn't about those things. Those are just like, hey, you dove really deep into the lore of this game. Here's a reward for you. Congratulations. It's more of a, a reward for your curiosity kind of thing. And I feel like the connection with Undertale is going to be the same in the sense that, yeah, it's going to be there. And if you go looking for it really deep in the lore, like you could probably find some connection to Ga to Gaster and some like some something about like how the Undertale universe might be connected in some sort of multiverse thing or simulation or whatever. But it's not what Deltarune is going to be about. Deltarune is not going to be about Undertale. It's not going to be about commenting on or rehashing the story from Undertale. It's just, a, it's a, it's its own thing using some of the same characters in a different setting. Although people are finding a lot of uh, Easter eggs even now. Yeah. Uh, playing back through Undertale, apparently uh, in Sans' room after the game, you'll be able to find in his room a uh, police badge, which has no reason to be in Undertale, but has plenty of reason to be in Delta Room, and a picture, a, a scrawled picture of three people smiling in the game and the mm -hmm. number three has a lot more relevance in delta rune than it does in undertale as well yeah i also believe that in the switch version of undertale they added like an extra room with a lot more dialogue with sans and he will at some point mention the kid with horns and her sister which like seems to be a reference to Suzy, uh, to to Noel, right? Like so, if, so I think it, like Toby Fox is definitely like if you are that deep lore fan who really wants to find all of the threads and the connections, they're gonna be there. But it's not what Delta Rune is about as such. If it's more as it's more as if there is an under underlying uh, meta uh, meta plot going on throughout uh, Toby Fox's games and like his exploration of themes like multiverse uh, multiversal themes, how stories are structured. Uh, how the structure itself might, might in fact be antagonistic to the people within the story. I feel like that's what's going on with the whole WD Gaster situation and that there are basically two stories going on and they, they intersect at interesting points, but they don't necessarily affect each other, right? Yeah, and I believe this. I believe the production history is that Deltarune, like Toby Fox wanted to make Deltarune for a long time, but he kind of made Undertale first as either a practice run or like as, as like he wanted he had a different thing in mind. But Deltarune has been in the back of his mind since forever. So it might be a sort of chicken and egg thing where Deltarune came first as a story that Fox was developing, and then he made Undertale as a sort of side exercise to that. So it might be that Deltarune really is the main game, and Undertale is more of a is more of an alternate universe story than that. Yeah, and imagine your first runs, your practice runs being that successful, man. <laughs> yeah, the pressure, Jesus. Oh God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your, your practice one happens to be like the game of the year for that year, and now you have to follow up with multiple chapters on the game that you intended to make. Um, and that is the. But you do get scenario. to play Smash Brothers That's with Sakurai, so you know it works out. Yeah, it worked out great for him. Um, pressure's on, but he seems to be doing. He seems to be thriving with uh, under that kind of pre uh, pressure. If if the first two chapters for Delta Rooms any indication, this yeah. has been just great so far even if even if i do kind of miss the uh, player impact of uh, undertale but obviously that's just the uh, intention of the game itself yeah uh let's see matt pat likely won't make a theory for delta room with the last drama with toby unfortunately i don't know what that's referencing but uh, okay um yeah, i haven't been paying attention to uh, matt pat either yeah thoughts on sans uh, and toriel's see... interactions they're cute they're adorable like they, they, they let them get together they're cute. Uh, like, Toriel deserves something better than Ascor. <laughs> let's see. Zathstar mentioned, why do you think that Chris is the knight? Because the time frames don't add up. Wouldn't it make more sense for Chris to only try out how to make thousands because he learned how to make one earlier? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by the time frame is not matching up with Cyberworld. Because we do know that at the very end of Chapter 1, it's dead at night, everybody else is asleep, and Chris takes full control of their body back again. So yeah. there is a giant span between the start of chapter two and chapter one, where Chris basically has full control, uh, full access to the town itself. In terms of making the cyber world, uh, literally they snuck through their window and stabbed a hole through the floor of the library. Yeah, I mean, I, th and, I, th I think that that would be how that worked out. But like it is, like again, if Toby Fox wants to throw a wrench in the works, then yeah, that theory could be true that Chris is only trying to make a dark fountain now 
because they have found out how to do it and someone else was responsible for starting the whole thing? Sure, why not? Like, we do have that shadowy presence that's manipulating Jevil and Spamton, so that could be possible and that would be a great plot twist, but I don't think we have any reason to think so yet. But also, Chris is explicitly laid out as the uh, Roaring Knight through uh, Ralsei's uh, description of him, right? The, uh, the, the blade shining in the dark, forcing their will through the knife and then stabbing it to create the fountain. That's all demonstrated. That's all the the known characteristics of the Roaring Knight. And that was explicitly demonstrated through Chris's actions once they got their body back at the end of the game. Yeah. Uh, someone says asked what we think the Dark World is going to be in Chapter 3, given that it was made in Toriel's house. And I think, and this is just me, again, because I think there is a religious theming here, I think that the Dark World is going to be really religiously related. Like, it's going to be, like, heaven or hell, or it's going to be a church. Like, it's going to be church-themed, something like that. Like, that that, that would be my, my theory. Do you have any thoughts? Um... It might even be a game show. Oh, it could be a game TV show because t-shirt. the TV is there and the yeah. TV lights up with a smile. That's right. That smile is very, very familiar too. Oh, Except yeah. Except for smile. Yeah, so, again, uh, <laughs> much in the same way that like at the, the, the cliffhanger at the end of chapter one was sort of a, a thing to make all the Undertale fans think that Kara is back. I think I think the, the, the smile on the TV is basically just a tease to make everyone think Flowey is back. But Flowey uh, is Asriel, well. so, you know. Like, obviously, especially with the, uh, especially with the Golden Sun aspects of Asriel, I wouldn't be surprised if that, if uh, we might be onto something with, the, in regards to Flowey being Asriel and Flowey being re- uh, represented at the uh, Stinger for Chapter 3. Yeah. Because, like, one thing we do know is that Asriel's really popular with everybody, including their parents. And the one thing we do know about uh Toriel is that she is very much at, uh eagerly anticipating the return of her golden son to uh to his hometown yeah so yeah the especially as let me think chapter two is also technically day two isn't it yeah it's it's only like, been a day yeah 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 two days and three years oh boy this might take a while but uh yeah we know that Azrael is coming back. We know that it's going to be imminent. So we know that that kind of thought is going to be weighing, especially prominently on the minds of his parents. Uh, I would not be surprised to see that playing a big part in whatever's happening in Chapter 3. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. Let's see. What else is chat saying? Uh... If we're going off Jevil referencing Queen, Spamton referring to Heaven might be relevant. Yeah, I mean, that's that's also the kind of thing that I think. Um, did you ever think Chris driving the car in the Dark World stands out? I think Burger Guy suggests in Chapter 1, Asriel drives them around cruising for girls. More for the Jealous Brother theory. Yeah, I that's mean... A real observation. It, it is interesting that, that, that Chris knows how to drive a car, because uh, they're a little young for that. Uh, <laughs> and choice between running people over and not also happens to be completely unrelated to the uh to which route you end up in that just might be too much video games on chris's part though yeah. <laughs> let's be fair <laughs> that just might be too much video games his, his their idea of what driving involves might be it might be a little skewed how do you think toriel and ralsei will interact with each other if they meet do you think toriel will mistake him for asriel i'm so curious to find out like, because, oh because, like, my thinking is that maybe in chapter three, Asri, uh, Ral- Ralsei isn't there. Because, because That's they rem- remember, remember, in, in like in chapter two, they go to the school first and they go and get Ralsei from that dark world and bring him to the library in that sense. But maybe this dark world is one that Ralsei doesn't have access to. Although definitely with Ralsei in the Dark World, things don't necessarily match up with that guy, right? He is yeah. the one Darkener, at least the one that we know of, that is not affected by the rules of the Dark World. Like everybody else, uh, as as Pedro mentioned, he was already in the library, right? But we know for a fact that Ralsei is the sole exception to the Dark World rule, where if you're a Darkener, if you go to another Dark World's fountain, you get turned into stone. 
Yeah, and he's also the only one capable of, like, Ralsei has created a dark world where all darkness can be, because you can recruit characters to come over to your town there. Um, but and they're he, not affected. But that's something none of, like, that's something king can't do, that's something queen can't do. So yeah, like, there's a lot of interesting stuff about Ralsei. Like, where, where again, which is where I'd, I'd say, like, it might be the twist of, of the third game that that Ralsei just isn't there. <laughs> uh, he might not be aware of the Dark World coming in in time. Now, I think the fact that you can give him an offensive item that at the very end of the game, after you've already been in everybody, suggests that that item is supposed to be uh, potentially used later on. The, the puppet scarf, which raises so many interesting implications. But... To have access to it right away? Probably not. I think the, you can make a case that uh, Oreo as a mother figure is supposed to fill in the healer responsibility in terms of like role-playing parties that Ralsei would otherwise occupy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, God, I'm so curious about Chapter 3. I'm so desperate for it. Uh, Anna asked in chat that uh, Chris seems seems coded neuro, neuro atypical um, to them, which I think... Yeah, like, I think you can, like, Chris is sort of a blank slate character in a lot of ways. Like, we learn details about Chris from everybody else. But you can see, like, in terms of, of like, Chris seems to have trouble relating to people. Chris seems to have trouble sort of being social. Seems to have trouble expressing themselves in a way that other people can sort of understand. And that's all stuff that I know is experienced by people, like, on the autistic spectrum, for example. Um, so I think that's a valid reading of the character. Um, it's also, I believe... And someone who knows more than me can bring me up on the statistics yet, but I believe it's more common for people on the uh, autistic spectrum to be non-binary also. Although for Chris, I think Chris is non-binary just because because they're the player character and they don't need a gender. And it's completely optional for uh, Chris in, in particular, specifically because of the role they play in the game. Um, I do hesitate to make any sort of like Prognostic about about their uh, mental characteristics for obvious reasons. Uh, that's not necessarily always the safest exercise, but definitely it's harder for them to. Uh, re it's harder for their their direct colleagues to relate to Chris than it is to relate to each other, and the fact that they are the so human character in the game is probably metaphorical for that as well. Especially since we know for a fact that that Torio has explicitly checked out books about how to raise humans and compare, compare in comparison to how to raise monsters. And that's kind of like a, a, a very, very on the nose thing to do when you happen to be the adopted parent or rather the uh, rather if you happen to be a first time parent for an autistic, autistic child or the otherwise neurodivergent child. Yeah, like that's the thing is like you can see Chris as being either adopted, obviously, because they're the only human, but you can also see them as, if you want to read them as, as Nero atypical, if you want to read them, for example, th they could be, like, that could be, be a reflection of how they are different from their community, that they relate differently to other, like, in, in a very different way that needs different care. Um, so I think it's a very valid reading of the character. Um, oh, someone just, asks what we think about the bunker. Oh, that's a creepy-ass place. I have no idea what to think about, about it yet. Um... Given that we have seen no clues of December's presence anywhere else, I kind of want to say that the absolute, like, the the BGM shuts down near the bunker, you get nothing but like a howling silence, or a war, uh, if you want to put it, a roaring silence. <laughs> um, but it also kind of looks like the, uh, I may be reading too much into it. I want to say there's some kind of like, uh, metaphorical, like, Symbolic uh, link to Undertale there, but I'm not sure if that's necessarily the right read, except for the fact that you go underground. Um, but the bunker exists. Uh, the bunker is unlike any other place in the overworld. And yeah, as uh, as our commenters, as our com uh, comment section has noted, the bunker apparently makes gaster like noises, but slow down or pitch edited, right? And it's either just Toby Fox reuse the aspects because it makes sense to reuse that aspect, or it could make sense that the bunker itself is hiding a secret that the town doesn't want exposed. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly my read on it, is that the bunker is like, it's like, it's that creepy place at the edge of town that all the townsfolk refuse to talk about for some unspecified reason. And like, 
the way that it's framed, like the way, like when you approach it, like the, the music cuts out. I believe you can have a character encounter with some characters who are there, like talking about, oh, this creepy place, like some creepy shit happened here sometime, long time ago. Shh, don't talk about that. We're not supposed, like something like that. So it's, it's one of those things that's like, it's, um, it's, um, what's it called? A Chekhov's gun, right? Like it's, it's, this is an object that's being placed here so that we all see it and go, ooh, something's going to happen with that thing. That thing's going to, like, something's going to happen. There's going to be a thing. There's going to be a thing there that's important. But it's not yet. Like, it's going to be fired by the end of the play, Chekhov's gun, but it's not going to go off just yet. Also, it's clearly not an Easter egg either because of how no. prominently it's displayed, right? It's definitely part of the world. It's definitely mentioned by the world itself. And you have access to it, very, very easy access, that you don't necessarily need to go out of the way for because the game expects you to be exploring the town. Yeah. So, whatever it is, it's a loaded cannon of a Chekhov's gun, honestly. It's going to explode in our faces. And uh, when it does... Uh, Boy. Yeah, at some point, uh, like, my, my, my guess would be at some point, Chris is going to make a dark fountain there, and that's when we're going to get to explore. That might even be the final dark fountain, right? Yeah. Um, taking out the entire town in the process. It could be, yeah, like, whoo, whoo, yeah. <laughs> and it's, I mean, it's probably going to have something to do with what, whatever happened to December, I'm sure. Um, I'm sure. Uh, someone asks about the tea theory. Right. Okay. So the tea theory is that you can get these teas that are flavored for each individual character. So you can get Chris tea, you can get Susie tea, you can get Rolse tea, you can get Noel tea. And the tea is an, a restorative item that restores a different amount of health to different characters depending on how they feel about the person who the tea is flavored after. So Noel gets a huge HP boost from Susie tea, and Susie gets a huge uh, HP boost from Noel tea, but Chris doesn't get a very big HP boost from Ralse T. Like, it's... It, it heals him. It heals them, rather, sorry. Uh, but not that much. And that is interesting. Like, that's one of those things that people are pointing to to say that, like, that's one of the things that makes Ralse a little suspect. That Chris seems to have somehow slightly mixed feelings about Ralse. Which, again, is what, what I'd say. Like, if Ralse is a representation of Asriel, yeah, that, that to me says complicated relationship with the brother. Like, that's what that says to me. Um, yeah, the tease as a Easter egg for their personal relations. Yeah, the fact that Susie gets the Susie T basically, uh, basically is a universal heal. Um, definitely the fact that there is a uh, tepid relationship, tepid is a perfect description for a T situation, but a tepid relationship between Chris, the actual character, and Rousey is really revealing. Um, especially since we know, with uh, in our deeper dives in, in, into the game, that they only they've only really interacted twice, right? Kind of makes sense on why it's only a, like a mild a mild healing char characteristic, because ultimately Chris as a character hasn't had a chance to know Rousey all that well. Yeah, vice versa. That's true. That's true. Uh, someone else in chat asked, "Oh, thoughts on there being seven days till Asriel's return, as well as seven chapters to total?" Yeah, that's. Yeah, yeah, that's intentional. Yeah. Like that, that I, I believe Absolutely. that's the whole point is that Asriel is coming back and some shit is going to have to go down before, like, I believe Asriel's return is the inciting incident for Chris. Like, it's the reason why Chris is doing everything that they're doing. Yeah. Um, whatever Asriel's involved in, it's definitely a, the root of Chris's trauma. So whatever's going, like, What's the term? What was the trope for the uh, absent, the uh, an absent character that otherwise affects everything else that's going on in the plot? Oh, it's I like don't an, remember the name. Time. Yeah, I need to read TV tropes more, which is not <laughs> something I actually want to say. But 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 we know what we're talking about. Uh, the the fact is, everything in the game itself is rooted to uh, Azrael's involvement in their previous winter. And we are very much in the uh, late autumn of, of the setting as well. I would not be surprised if in the final game, snow starts falling down, because that definitely seems like a sort of symbolic thing that is uh, inherent to the uh, to the setting. Yeah, let's see. What else? What are my thoughts on Lancer being the Dark Prince? The Dark Prince of that particular universe is Ralsei. Or, or, or are you well, referring actually, to the idea that... that Ralsei isn't the Dark Prince, but just said that he was? 
Um, let me think. If we assume that the prophecy is true regardless of the dark fountains, there's a good argument that Ralph Lancer is the, the intended dark prince of that realm, and that Noel is the dark prince of chapter two, or dark princess. Yeah. Does I have mean, a relationship yeah. to the queen. You could, yeah. You could, uh, you could make that argument. Have you talked about Ascor backdoor yet? Oh, phrasing, uh, but yeah, there's a locked room. Phrasing there's a locked you. door um, at the back of a Ascor's shop, and we don't know what's in there. It's much the same as the uh, as the bunker. It's it's like it's a thing that's clearly oh, there's a locked door here. Well, we know that it's gonna get unlocked at some point, and something's gonna be there, but we have no idea what's in there. Yeah, it will be a traumatic experience once we find out, or it could just be Ascor's personal private shame, and therefore be a bit of a dark comedy. Asgore just doesn't get any breaks this universe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jason Borgado says, Borgado says, Alphys would like to know about the Asgore backdoor. Boy, what is, that's, that's one way to put it. Steady on there, so chat. There... Steady on. <laughs> I know you like uh, a daddy, but don't get too excited. Um... Oh, darker yet darker. Guys, <laughs> uh, crazy. Please, please. Yeah. Ah, <sighs> see. Oh yeah, right. Onion San. Right, like, uh, so there's this character called Onion San that you can meet in the lake of Delta Rune Chapter One, and for some people in Chapter Two, he hasn't shown up. He certainly didn't show up for me, even though I encountered him in the first chapter. Uh, I don't know that that has any particular relevance. Like Onion San, as far as I know, doesn't say anything special. So, I don't think it's that. I don't, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure Onion San in this case is just an Easter egg character. Yeah, probably. I'm calling it Noel's dad is going to die. Yeah. Like, that's also my read on the character is that, like, you meet him in chapter one and he's in hospital and like he's like, ah, eh, they're just running some tests. No big deal. And then you meet him in chapter two and then he says they needed to run some more tests in that sort of very much in that particular way that says it's not just tests. He's going to stay there for a while and he might not get out again. And like, I think I don't think necessarily 100 percent that he is going to die. But I think the threat of him dying is a big part of Noelle's story. Like that, like again, in terms of that she needs to learn how to deal with her goddamn mother because her dad is not necessarily going to be around to help her deal with that relationship all the time, which is why her dad is so anxious for her to become like more self-reliant and more able to say no and stand up for herself. Um, uh, Noelle says also the best friend for Asgore. So I would assume that, fortunately, he might be treated as the as the fridge girlfriend for multiple characters in this game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. Yeah. Like again. Like this game. It's it's a cutesy little game with some nice child characters, but holy fuck, does it get dark? Yeah. And uh, it really encourages you to be absolutely unabashedly uh, evil in order to get some of the some of the plot that gets out of this game. Shit, man, that's 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 one way to extrapolate on the backstory. Make yeah. this feel extremely uncomfortable in the process. Let's see. Uh, uh, what do you guys think about the Snowden wrong call? I don't know about that. Uh, oh, uh, some that say it's been. Oh, that's an Undertale. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Right. Like, it, I wouldn't put it past Fox to put those kinds of teasers in there, but. Um. Like the intersection between Undertale and Delta Rune, I still feel is relatively tangential to each other. They're they're not as like they have a couple have overlaps in character design, a couple in a couple of like meta textual points, but these are definitely more uh, Easter eggs than necessarily odd relevant to the uh, to the uh, main storyline. Yeah. Uh, are there any interviews or tidbits hidden in uh, on the internet about when we can expect the next chapter? Nope. Toby, Toby, like Toby Fox has said that a lot of the work necessary for the rest of the chapters was done with chapter two. Like they did a lot of like creating the back end and like building up the systems and like the programming language and stuff to make the chapters faster. But it's game development. Like you, you, we have. It could be another three years. It could be another six months. Who knows? There, there's no way to tell. How do you think? Do you know that the development oh, team? Yeah. Sorry, sorry. 
Uh, we do know that the development team for Undertale for uh, Delta Rune Chapter Two was significantly bigger than both Chapter One and Undertale itself, because Undertale itself was basically a one-man project with an artist and a, and a, with an artist to help him. Um, so what we can expect is that it won't take us three years. But like, other than that, like we didn't even expect uh, chapter. We didn't fully expect Chapter Two to come out when it did. Because the announcement stream itself was basically just an anniversary stream to celebrate like the, a milestone for Chapter One, right? And a milestone for Undertale itself. Yeah. And then, and then he dropped a whole brand new scenario on us midstream that we've never seen before or even heard of. Yeah, he fucking shadow point. dropped that shit, the bastard. I had to drop all my plans to make the, to fucking stream it. I don't mind, but God damn it, Toby. Um. So someone asks how we think continuity is going to be handled, assuming each chapter has a weird route. And I'm interested in that as well, because, like, yeah. Noelle is a different character at the end of chapter two if you do the weird route. Like, she's a different character. She's not the same person anymore. She has been changed. And so, like, again, this is one of the things that, that makes this, like, a terrifyingly escalating project in terms of scale and scope is that she can't be the same character in chapter three if you did the weird route, which means if insofar as she's involved, like, I think the way they're going to handle it is that Noel is just not going to feature much in chapter three or chapter four or five, like that, that every time you make these changes, these weird route changes, it changes some part of the story, but it doesn't necessarily mean that each chapter has to be completely different based on what route you choose. Like, I think they're all designed to be self-contained in a lot of ways. Although I also think that because of that, the main thing we're going to be seeing changed are differences in dialogue between NPCs because of what happened in chapter two. Yeah. Like for by and large, the character development for Noel and Birdly, especially, is pretty much complete by the end of the game, regardless of how you finish it. But physically, I expect there to be differences in how and whether or not we see certain character models, if you get what I mean. Yeah, and also Birdly is going to be dead, you know, so. <laughs> so, like, so like yeah, the, the, um, the necessity there is that, like, since Birdly is, is, might be dead at the end of the weird route, it's just, okay, so don't write a lot of scenes where he's super important in the next chapters. Which is fine, because ultimately his, his, his character arc is done and dusted, like, it's complete. Yeah, like, he, do he doesn't need more development as such. So, like, you, you can kill him off, and it's not that big a deal, except emotionally. Yeah, it it, it kind of sucks to say that's not a big a deal if somebody dies, but it's Birdly. I don't think we hear that much. Yeah, and I think uh, we are about coming up at, on the two hours. Yeah, we are at the two hours, actually. <laughs> um, perfect, which actually. is probably a good place to cut it. So, uh... Thank you all very much for tuning in. Thank you for listening to us talk about Delta Rune as much as we did, because boy howdy, there's a lot to talk about with with those games. And thank you, Lucian, for coming on to discuss it with me. Where can people find you? Yes. So you can find me on either my YouTube channel, which doesn't have a custom URL yet, or you can find me on Twitter at Lucian Zinner. Uh, I think I've uh, uh, it was previous on a slide. Uh, to note, I do have a giveaway right now, because, just like a personal celebration, giving away a free copy of uh, Clip Studio Pro. You will find that tweet actually pinned on my profile, so that be, should be very, very easy to find. Clip Studio Pro, yeah, by like, the way, is the best illustration. Like, it's better than Photoshop, better than anything else. If you can get a hold of that, absolutely go get it. And you only need to pay it once, unlike with an Adobe license, because yeah. fuck Adobe. Yeah, fuck Adobe. I hate that I'm trapped with them uh but yeah lucian yeah. does a lot of a uh, lot of streaming what is it guilty gear currently you're you're still grinding away on that you're doing some uh yeah. visual novels and horror games um especially since it's october i've been playing through a uh, yuma nikki uh dream diary the uh, 2018 release um uh, if you happen to be a fighting game player or if you know a fighting game content creator that's just getting started i would love to money match them uh, or just uh, challenge them to uh, do uh, like punishment games through fighting games. Whoever loses a best of 10 has to play a horror game of some kind or something like that. Uh, that is pretty much an open invitation to anybody. And frankly, I just, 
I found myself addicted particularly to Guilty Gear Strive as of late, which just happened to have a huge patch. If you want a patch rundown on that as well, I did a recent stream on that. And I'll probably be continuing to do that until I get bored of the uh, uh, fighting games in general. But uh, that's not anytime soon. <laughs> that's not anytime soon. Yeah, know the feeling. I have so many things in the works as well. But yeah, anyway, that's the end of our Deltarune stream. Thank you all very much for tuning in. Uh, do consider supporting either myself um, or uh, Lucian in such ways as you are able to, because it helps us a lot with doing this sort of thing. Like, comment, subscribe. Uh, do other things as well. And outside of that, wear a mask, wash your hands, take the vaccine when you can. Take the fucking flu shot, by the way. It's flu season. You need your flu shot. And the reason you need your flu shot is because having the flu sucks, first of all, but also because you don't want to be the person who gets a really bad flu infection and needs medical care in the middle of a pandemic. Get your flu shot. They're available. They're pretty cheap or they're free if you're lucky. Yes, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Try to act with solidarity towards those who are working to make the world a better place. <laughs>